Hey, up and welcome back. Well, a uh, bit of a melancholic one this, uh, but uh, had to be done really. So, uh, whilst this footage of the beautiful Yorkshire Dales from a couple of years ago plays through, I'd just like to talk about what the most likely threats are to our motorcycling freedoms and how we might deal with them. Now, as motorcyclists, of course, we value our freedoms more than most given that our motorcycles represent our passion, our quality of life, our aid to mental health, our free spirit. We live and breathe the ride, and the freedom to jump on our bikes on a sunny day like this and explore our land is life-affirming and is as precious as it is fragile. I do think it's important to look at current affairs from time to time because current affairs shape future affairs and there's no greater weapon in the armoury than being prepared. But before we talk about those threats, let's take stock of where we are currently as a so-called free and democratic society. In a nutshell, we're being right royally screwed over screwed over by a political class, a corporate class and a broadcast and print media class who are in perfect lockstep with each other and whose primary ambition is the continued acquisition of more and more power and more and more wealth and all of it to be harvested from us, the taxpaying public. Let me say from the outset that I do not believe that there is a mainstream political party out there anywhere in the UK which is minded to put right the wrongs done to us year on year for the last decade or more. They are all in the pockets of the rich, powerful and largely malign entities within the big corporate organisations. You know, the ones which fund the main political parties and which own the media, the media which so loves to feed us lie upon lie and seek to fan the flames of the worst traits of humanity through hate fueled headlines and dog whistle narratives. Let's ask ourselves this. Who used to own all of our critical infrastructure as a country? Who used to own the railways? Well, we did, the taxpaying public. Who used to own the provision of water services? We did. The postal service? We did. Bus services? We did. Electricity supplies? We did. Gas supplies? We did. Telecommunications? We did. The list goes on. But now we find ourselves in a world where all of these critical aspects of life are owned by private companies, many of them foreign private companies, whose executives skim off all the profits to pay themselves and their shareholders massive amounts of cash, whilst leaving the infrastructure to rot due to lack of investment. You know, I can remember when all of these essential services were publicly owned. When the profits came back to us, the taxpayers, instead of foreign hedge funds. An investment was managed in the interest of all of society, not the pockets of the already rich and powerful. I'm not saying for a minute that the publicly owned services of the 60s and 70s were perfect. For one thing, they were limited by the technology of the day but they were at least honourable in their own way, fair in their own way, and largely uncorrupted. Today, 
society is being shaped on the back of years of decreasing living standards for the many, a massively increased wealth for the few, and a media which gives not a toss for the truth of all this. So what has all this to do with our motorcycle freedoms? Well, it's coming, bear with. You see, I see two big existential threats to private vehicle ownership and use. The first one is another lockdown. And the second one is the so-called net zero agenda, which itself could lead to a form of lockdown. Now we can box the first one off fairly quickly. Pandemics are a fact of life. The next one could be next week or not for many decades. And we can only hope that future responses will be more thoughtful and proportionate than the last time around, when we were basically forced into compliance through fear. A fear fueled by a large amount of selective reporting and at times pure propaganda. If there is a next time, any time soon, we need to think long and hard before we roll over and rinse away our rights whilst the high and mighty carry on partying. So the second threat, that of the net zero movement, is a bit more complicated. Now I am far from being a climate change denier. Indeed the extreme weather events at home and across the planet are all too plain to see. But two big questions emerge. The first is, is it wholly or mainly man-made or is it just part of the Earth's historic patterns of warming and cooling? And second, if it is wholly or mainly man-made, are the current net zero policies, as expressed in relation to private vehicle use, the right way to go about dressing things? ULES zones, CAS zones, decreasing speed limits on non-residential open roads, 15 minute cities, road charging, all stick and no carrot. However, it seems that the current scientific consensus is coalescing around the mainly man-made theory. But we must remember that science itself is not fixed and tends to ebb and flow through history. Now, for example, in the 1960s and 70s, you could be forgiven for thinking that all that was required to live a long and healthy life was to spread stalk or blue band margarine on your bread and fry everything in crisp and dry. Well, nobody believes that anymore. Science changes and so does its prevailing wisdom. Now, if there's one thing I've learned from 30 years in policing, it's that people with power become accustomed to exercising power, often for its own sake. Policing is an excellent microcosm in which to witness how power play works more broadly in society. I've witnessed some seemingly irrational and blatantly unfair decisions made at a senior level. Until you realise, that is, that an entirely different agenda rooted in personal ambitions is playing out. This is why we can and should expect the unthinkable when it comes to the green agenda being rammed home with the British motorist. An easy target, maximum returns for minimum effort, typical lazy politics from bone idle politicians with mediocre levels of talent. There's now such a vast amount of money invested by governments and corporations into the green agenda 
that any and all outcomes for us as private vehicle users is possible. There could well come a time when the ill-conceived electric only approach to transportation produces three outcomes. One, restrictions on availability or prohibitive pricing of fuel. Two, restrictions on or the outright banning of the use of internal combustion engine vehicles in some or all areas. And likely an electric powered alternative which is largely completely unaffordable for normal working people. In a nutshell, we would go back 100 years to when only the wealthy and privileged had access to private independent transport and the rest of us were left to stew at home, mostly in homes we didn't even own. It's happening all over again and it will continue to worsen until anything and everything is owned by a tiny elite minority and we're all left with the fag ends of a life where we will do only what they allow us to do and that will not include riding your motorcycle through the landscape on a sunny spring day. So what can we do to ensure that our freedom to enjoy our passion is preserved? Well first and foremost we must all continue to spread the word via social media, day-to-day -day personal interactions, through lobbying groups such as the Motorcycle Action Group and through the published motorcycle media. We should also be all over our local councillors and MPs the minute we get a sniff of restrictions on our freedom to ride. Secondly, we should as individuals resist the creep of unaffordable and utterly impractical electric cars and motorcycles. Don't buy them. And if and when regulations prohibit you from buying anything other than electric, keep your old car a bike. Have it properly, professionally and regularly maintained. Nurture it like a newborn baby and it will keep on running for many, many years. And here's the irony, it will be greener than any electric vehicle. The effects of climate change may well present serious challenges to humanity, but effectively locking down or pricing out recreational vehicle use by ordinary people, whilst allowing the tax-dodging elites to fly around in private jets and sail the seas in ship-sized yachts is not the way to address a global problem. So alas, because money and power will always be used to secure more power and more wealth, leached from us, the people, and because governments of whatever political colour will always be the servants of that wealth and power, we should be prepared to expect anything, because logic and fairness has no place in the world anymore. In short, we're being made to have it and our cars and bikes and freedoms to travel through our country are the low hanging fruit ripe for picking. I'm left with one very stark and one very dark thought. This is no longer the country my father fought for. <laughs>